Our next guest is a man on a mission, Paul Brennan. He's a broadcaster here on RNZ, but in his spare time, uh, it's taken up with an aviation preservation project. Paul wants to bring our birds home. It's a campaign to try to track down planes that flew here between 1959 and 1981. He's identified planes, he says, are of uh, cultural significance. First, the Lockheed Electra in 1959. Then the Boeing 737 in 1968 and its successor, the 747 in 1981. And he also wants to repatriate the Douglas DC-8 that first flew here in 1968 and its successor, the DC-10, that arrived in 1976. And those planes flew with the livery of Air New Zealand's predecessor, Teal, the Tasman Empire Airways Limited, NAC, the National Airways Corporation, and then Air New Zealand itself. And Paul is uh, on the show now. Now, Paul Brennan, welcome to the show. Morning, Wallace. Kia ora, everybody. Great to be here. Thanks. Did, did you have you ever? Uh, uh, I mean, did you ever ride on any of these planes yourself? I rode on the seven four seven, and there's a story about that. I'll tell you in just a moment. I rode on the seven three seven. Didn't ride on the Electra or the DC ten. Uh, or the DC-8, though as a kid I used to go and watch the DC-8s come into Wellington. That was always a, a great day. So familiar with all of them, ridden on two of them. The 747, see that captured my imagination. I'm old enough to remember the, 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 the huge bird in the skies that was the 747, but never went on one. What was it like up there? Well, obviously it's like a building in the sky. It is the aircraft, the um, in, in history terms, in the bigger picture, that changed the world. It's an icon of the 20th century, uh, I guess a, an example of the success of the Western world at the time. And because of its capacity, it enabled everyday people like you and I, Wallace, to be able to <laughs> afford to travel to all parts of the globe. Before that, it was a very expensive um, thing to do, to travel on a jet plane across the world. The 747 changed that forever, and it will forever be remembered for that. Mm. I can't give you any planes, Paul, but I've got a personal story because my family are a family of engineers for uh, Air New Zealand going right back. And so when I used to visit Grandad, I used to get these great teal bags. Okay. Well, the collector's items now, of course. Are they? Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's, a, I think, quite a big uh, collectibles market in airline bags. And, and that teal bag and old Air New Zealand bags, part of that for sure. Well, I sold so it years, years ago. I was going to say, hang on to it. <laughs> <laughs> why, why are you trying to get these old planes home? Well, um, first of all, the fact that any of them exist at all is sort of a miracle because um, usually when air- airliners are finished with in commercial service, they, um, um, and, and particularly in more modern times, they'll, they'll send them to the desert, they'll pull all the parts off them, and once that has uh, happened, they'll literally rip them to pieces, melt them down, and the joke is they become you know, beer cans, Coke cans. So um, it's pretty rare after all this time to find some still in existence, especially related to our small country. We didn't operate big fleets of aircraft, so you know there weren't too many to choose from at the start. And, of course, mm. all these years later, to find out that some are still left, and I've got an update on two of those uh, that you mentioned, which is a little disappointing, but there's a silver lining as well. To find that they still exist after all these years is sort of a... You know, it, it, the odds against it are, are great, and it's a miracle that any of them have survived. And I think that tells you something, tells it that you've got a very narrow window of opportunity if you want to save them. That's what it tells you. How did the idea even come up, Paul? I mean, was it a conversation you had? Is it something personal to you? Have you been an aviation fan, you know, for, for, for many years? How did this idea start, bring well, our birds home? I've always liked the planes. Always used to go to the airport with Dad mainly and sit up there and watch the old NAC friendships and Viscounts and the 7.3s and the DC-8s come in. And Sunday afternoon was great for that because I think they were at their busiest. So I always <laughs> had an interest in that. And then through the 2000s, got involved in aviation media and traveled around the world doing a lot of filming and uh, a lot of early uh, webcasting, actually, uh, relating to that from some of the big air shows in the States. Got to meet some very famous people in aviation. Really got to appreciate the culture of it. And, and you know, it's a great human achievement, flying. It's hard, you can't understate that. And where it's come to now, what is 114, 114 years since the Wright brothers took off, or Richard Pierce, depending on who you believe was <laughs> first to fly. Um, and in that time now, you know, um, it, it moves everybody in the world. I can remember a time where we used to go to the, to the wharf to see people off on ships overseas. 
wasn't that long ago. Yeah. Uh, that's completely gone now. So, um, you know, there's a huge global interest in it. It's a great culture. And um, these aircraft types tell the story of the building of civilization. And we can localize it back to New Zealand with the types that we operated. Remember, in um, uh, post-war um, and into the early 50s, we were flying across the Tasman on flying boats at 8,000 feet, nine-hour flights. <laughs> I mean, imagine doing that today. It's amazing, isn't it? I, in fact, you just, you've got to remind yourself they actually existed looking back in old photographs. And, and they do bring back memory. I mean, we're going to get flooded with uh, memories now. When you mention um, planes like, or, you know, for example, the National Airways Corporation, NAC, these are big memories for people. Oh, yeah. And um, you've got to think back, too, to that time. Speaking of NAC, of course, we had the 737 in New Zealand for 47 years. Think about that. Nearly half a, a century. Um, now, it could have been another type. Uh, we, back in those days, in the 60s, it was expected that we would buy British, right? And mm -hmm. there were British uh, types available. Our guys went over to um, the UK. In fact, the UK sent uh, one of the examples over here and, and um, flew us all around and, and tried to sell the uh, aircraft to NAC, the BAC-111, as it was back in the day. Uh, our guys went to Seattle. Alan Kenning, uh, Captain Alan Kenning, the late Alan Kenning, was the man really who, who was responsible for us having that 737. And boy, didn't it do a great job for this country? Think about it. Mm. My question, Paul, is you mentioned the desert earlier on. Where are these planes around the world? OK, let's start with the oldest first, and that is the L-188 Electra. The one that we're looking for is ZKTEB. That was the registration when it arrived back in 1959. It was the second one delivered out of, I think, four. One crashed, and we got one from Qantas, I think, to replace the crashed one. That, ironically, is the only one... Well, no, actually, I can update that. At first, when we started looking, the only one that's still airworthy, <laughs> which is sort of counterintuitive, I guess, is the, the way of thinking about it. It is uh, operating for... Uh, a company in Alberta, Canada, called uh, Buffalo Airways. Now, people might re remember the Ice Pilot series that was on TV. That's that airline. They operated as a water bomber, so when there's a forest fire, they send it up and, you know, they drop the retardant from it. It's still operational, which is great, because it means that we can, when the time comes, we can get it back. I'm talking with the manager of the company. Uh, they've got all the details. I've told them I want to be first in line when they've finished with that. So the, um, the, the uh, relationship is being built right now and it looks good. The second aircraft we're looking for is the DC-8. Now this was the, um, the third one delivered, uh, NZC, in 65 actually, uh, just to, to correct the date there. Um, now the arrival of the first one in that same year was one of the biggest deals ever. I've got film mm. of it, a Pathé film of it, and we've put it up on our Facebook page. That's had thousands of views. There's something about that aircraft that people really connect with, and I know what it is. It broke the tyranny of distance, Wallace. We were a Pacific airline before that aircraft came along. And then we got our DC-8s. We were able to go up to Los Angeles. We were able to go to Singapore, Hong Kong on our own airline. So it was like a liberation. And people saw it like that. Um, that aircraft is in Manaus, Brazil, right on the edge of the Amazon jungle. Good grief. It's been deserted there, uh, abandoned, since 2002. So it's been sitting there a long time. It uh, ended life as a freighter. And uh, now this is an aircraft that was fit to carry the Queen once. Uh, this aircraft carried the, the royal family around the Pacific Islands when they came here for the 74 Commonwealth Games. There's a great photo of it sitting in Rarotonga with the Queen's flag out the window. Mm. So we know that that is there. I've been talking to the Brazilian embassy, who have been great, by the way. They really get it. I know exactly... <laughs> ex You're passionate, Paul. Well... How do you find time for radio? <laughs> It's difficult, um, but, but, but it's, it's fantastic that people understand this and are willing to help because, you know, it's, it's quite difficult to connect with these um, foreign places in all parts of the world of different languages, different cultures, different legal systems. And uh, this one is sitting there. Uh, remarkably, it survived, and it's only survived because it's been the subject of a legal dispute for the last 14 years. If they'd sorted that out earlier, it'd be gone, long gone. So thank God for that. So that is looking really good. We know that's there. We've got uh, absolute proof that that's there. The 737, big disappointment this week, Wallace. Mm. We found out that it was, as the guy told me on the phone, crushed seven months ago. 
Uh, what do you mean by crushed? Well, destroyed, um, uh, uh, salvaged, melted down. Um, we missed it by seven months. We couldn't have stopped that because we've only set this campaign up in the last two months. But we thought we had that one. And that aircraft was NAD. That was the second 737 delivered to NAC in 1968. And sadly, because it very historic, it was the aircraft that flew the first domestic commercial jet service in our history. So it would have been so good mm. to have that. But we've found another one. Um, uh, an ex-Air New Zealand um, 737 that um, uh, was delivered in 82. Uh, NQC is well, was the registration of that. It had the big cargo door on it. I call it the little engine that could because it's the <laughs> hardest working 73 in the country. It was here for 30 years, carried over 2 million passengers, about 180,000 tonnes of freight because it could be converted to a freighter at night. I used to hear it flying over at 2 in the morning in Wellington back in the day. <laughs> That's up in Canada. We found that at a place called Twilight. Riveras in Quebec. We're talking to the people who own it. It hasn't flown for about eight months, but it's still airworthy. So we didn't get NAD, but we can get this one. And if we can get this one, you know, in 20, 30, 40, 50 years, really, mm. does it make that much difference? I don't know. Uh, the 747, we thought we had that. It was the um, first 200 series delivered in 81. That was up at Doma de Dovo Airport, Moscow, operated by Transero Airlines, which is a Russian um, uh, inclusive tour carrier operator. They used to pack them in and fly them off to the holiday spots in this aircraft. Uh, they retired it in 2011, uh, but uh, and we thought it was there. We had photographic evidence. We had Google Earth shots. Tur yeah. It turned out we that, that had been scrapped about a year ago, which was very disappointing. But we've found another one. So um, a, a later model one, we're chasing down two options at the moment. One is in the desert, and it could be in some sort of condition, or it might be in bits. We're, we're trying to find out. But the last one that uh, Air New Zealand operated, uh, 400 series, 419, 19 being the New Zealand customer designator. That's how you know they're authentic. Um, is operating for a Spanish airline still, still flying. Still operating. Still operating, mm. probably for another three, four, five years. So, again, we're going to start talking to that company, uh, find the owner, put our hand up. And the DC-10, now, the D this is interesting. There's only one DC-10 left from the Air New Zealand uh, 8 that uh, we had between... Need seven. to get that one, need to get that one. Well, yeah, uh, and we know why that's important, and and that tragedy had nothing to do with the aircraft. It was operating perfectly at the time. So... Um, the DC-10 is sitting uh, abandoned, derelict, at Havana Airport in Cuba. Had a friend go through there the other day on a flight to Miami, he took a picture out the window. There it is, looking a little sad, but it's there and it's intact. I'm now speaking, communicating with the Cuban embassy in Wellington to find out how to go about rounding that one up. So, you know, we might get one, we Good might heavens. get two, we might get them all, but they're out there. This is all getting very geopolitical, um, uh, Paul. Um, my, the, the question really is that uh, it's all very well to have all these planes sitting out in the desert or Havana or the Amazon. Money. Yep, it's a pipe dream. It's, it's, a, all, it's a pipe dream, Paul. You're never going to get It's going to cost millions. Well, I'm not one of these no-before-yes Kiwis, okay? I'll tell you that for a start. <laughs> I don't want to hear from anyone who's no-before-yes. Actually, when you break it down, it's, it's not so daunting. First thing is oh, to make sure it. they're saved because this is what can happen. They can be... They can be trashed. We don't want that to happen. If we can stop that happening, it doesn't matter where they are in the world, they will be available. That's the first step. And that's not so hard, okay? Uh, the second in, in, what, in what way, just jumping in there, uh, because you mentioned that they are, these are items, in your view, of national significance. So for them to be saved and they're uh, you know, out of New Zealand jurisdiction, what, what, what can you do? Do you need New Zealand government help on this? We don't know. We can own them. Remember, they're junk. How much would I pay for your junk car? couple of hundred. Right, yeah, yeah, right, yes. You know, they're junk. So it's a matter of, uh, they're, they're big though, there's no question that we're talking about sizable uh, artifacts as we call them, and um, there are ways of breaking them down uh, over time and transporting them, that's nothing new, museums do that all the mm. time. Uh, the costs start to come in, um, assuming that you can get them for good price, for transportation to a place of storage. Now, I'm picking that there are enough Kiwis out there who are are sure about preserving our history, that if we get that far, are they really going to turn their back on it at that point? And this is perhaps where you might need listeners' help, Paul, uh, to We, we have a social media thing going, and I don't think, Wallace, we could have done this without social media, because we started from zero, one follower. 
All right. And uh, now we've got uh, hundreds of likes, uh, 900 likes and, and huge numbers of video views. We're starting to engage with that. And without that social media component, I don't think we'd be mm. where we are today. And, of course, with crowdfunding now, we don't need to go cap in hand for the initial part to corporates and to, you know, um, uh, people who, who may or may not give. And I think when we have the combination of a... You know, a backing from the public and enough funds to initiate the process. I think it starts to generate an energy of its own. We and bought it, a bit. We bought a beach. Well, there you go. And uh, and that beach wasn't going anywhere, was it? <laughs> All right, that beach wasn't going to be demolished and and sent off and melted down. Um, now, if people don't want to support this, if the culture doesn't want it, I get it. Right. Fair enough. But let's give it a go because these are the last ones available. And just imagine, a hundred years from now. 200 years from now, young Kiwis standing under those things, looking at them going, wow. You've got to think of it like that. You're selling it. You're selling it. I'm starting to get interested. Hey, the question for you, Paul, uh, is my Air New Zealand Junior... (laughs) Is my Air New Zealand Junior Jet Club badge worth keeping? Uh, Good point. Um, Yes, I think it is, yeah. Yeah, we could put it in one of the exhibitions with with these mm. aircraft. And here's the other thing to remember, because um, some of the negatives that come from this are around money and the expense, especially when it uh, comes to the cost of displaying these things. Museums aren't cheap. Uh, people say, what about Motat, all that? Yeah, we, we understand that. But um, uh, think of it this way. We can do all this for well under the price of the flag referendum, which we're nowhere, <laughs> all right? I mean, what use was that? in terms of history and going forward and future generations. So think of it like that. And the other thing is that we have a growing tourism industry. There are many people coming through this country. Good aviation museums in the world do great business, big time, for decades. So it's not such a stretch to see this working. Yes, there's a fantastic car museum I visited only last year in Wellington. Uh, Extraordinary collection, really. And, uh, you know, the level of care and love put into you know these these objects were quite something i suppose you i suppose that's what you're imagining uh for 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 new zealand aviation paul yes i am i can see within the next decade or so this being set up uh, there's certainly ways of displaying them the museum of flight in seattle is a great role model they've obviously got very large artifacts given that they're in the area of boeing um, the displaying 747s etc i know people who work there and who um uh, curate the artifacts there, and they've built a uh, roof structure there to accommodate their big artifacts for under ten million uh, U.S. dollars. It's fantastic. They're getting hundreds of thousands of people through there every month. Uh, people are paying to go through. There's no reason why we can't do this here. So, you know, it it might seem big, it might seem expensive, but it's doable. Uh, Matt uh, writes, Wallace, bring back the Bristol freighter. I remember those bumblebees buzzing over Cook's Strait. We have Strait. one. We have one. Oh, really? I yes. think in the Wigram uh, RNZ uh, RNZAF Museum there is one. And here's uh, that's a good point, though. We have a Viscount. We have a Viscount at Ferry Mead in Christchurch, so that's that's fine. We've got a Friendship at Wanaka. We've got the Solent at Motat. I think they've got a DC-3 Skymaster there, the Lodestar, the old Electra. What we are missing are the ones that we're trying to get. If there was, I'm talking about uh, bring back our planes, uh, the, or sorry, bring our birds home. It's a campaign to try to track down planes that flew here between 1959 and 1981. Our guest here, Paul Brennan, says these planes are of cultural significance. And if there was a plane that meant something specifically to you, Paul, uh, be it the 737 or the 747, the Douglas DC-8, DC-10s, what would it be? For you? I'd say two. I'd say the 737 because that built our modern day economy in this country. Um, It shrunk the country. We operated it for 47 years reliably every single day without one problem. All right? So that's incredible. And the DC 8 because it, it gave us control as a nation over our tyranny of distance and it got us into the jet age. We became a modern country, a modern culture when that arrived. Can do they have to be planes, uh, Paul? That flew here. Can't we get uh, other ones, like kind of look-alike ones that didn't necessarily fly here? I don't think they're authentic. They need to be, as I say, we've got uh, our own designator for Boeing one nine. You see one nine on the end of that. You mm. know it's a Kiwi. I say I say it like this: they're our birds because they were made for us. 
If we didn't order them, if we didn't want them, they wouldn't exist. That makes them ours. Now, what about Air New Zealand? I mean, the company seems to be on a bit of an international role. It's sort of often, uh, you know, high in the charts when it comes to favoured airline, that type of thing. Great airline. Uh, uh, would, would I mean, would they be able to come to the party on some sort of um, seed funding for bringing our birds home? I think it's up to us. That's a good question. A lot of people ask me that. I think it's up to us to prove that there is a movement or, or support in the culture, wider culture for this. If there's not, we get it. We go home, we pack up, we say, well, we tried, you know. Um, I think it needs to um, look to a company of their scale, and they're a busy company. They've got a lot, I mean, operating an airline is not an easy uh, operation. Um, and to, to use them specifically because you mentioned, but any other corporate of that size. I think if I was them, I'd want to see how this was going to go. And if it looked like it had the support, and if it looked like it had wheels, maybe I'd get in touch. But I honestly think it's up to us and the people to move it to that level. The interesting thing is, one of the uh, 787s has the same registration as the DC-8, NZC. Oh, really? Hmm? Mm. Oh, Frank uh, writes, uh, Paul, uh, I have a teal 60-style ashtray. They don't make them like that anymore. Well, they don't, I like don't have the... them at all, do they? <laughs> I like the DC-10 more than the, than the 747. One thing that struck me, because it would be very interesting, it's kind of a social um, experiment, isn't it, really, seeing these old planes, Paul? But uh, going back and looking, and it's not that, far, not, not, not that long ago, but if you go back and look at images of interiors, one thing stands out above all else, and it is astonishing, and that is leg room. Oh, yeah. they, they, had, they had leg room back in the day. We have no leg room whatsoever. Well, when those 737s arrived in 68, they were five abreast. So you can imagine really? the room. Oh, yeah, uh, for the first few years. Here's, I think people should think of it like this. These aircraft, even the individual ones, have carried millions of people. Every one of those people, every individual, they were going somewhere. They were coming back from somewhere. They were off to meet someone, good times, bad times, happy, tragic. The one constant linking all those stories, all that history, all that interaction together are those aircraft. All right, if you can help Paul Rennan on the plight to bring our birds home, uh, there is a Facebook page, isn't there, Paul? And also there's a Give a Little page if you want to add to the funding uh, to uh, bring these items of national significance home. And we don't need too much. We only need a little bit to get around those five locations. It's all about meeting people, establishing relationships, which are happening now, face-to-face, and we will stand the best chance of securing them. It's looking good so far but we're just really starting out on the journey and we so appreciate the time today, Was Paul, thanks for your time.